let's get underway here. Hello. So you're getting ready for your break now, or you may be on your break when you're seeing this. So this is uh, Dora and I got out, I think it was just yesterday, uh, to um, what's called the Macintosh Run Single Track Trail. It's actually a whole series of trails that um, they're single track in the sense that they're really designed for mountain bikers, although we walk them. <laughs> Dora can't ride a bike, and uh, but it's a vast, vast area of trails, huge number of them over several kilometers, and uh, we like going out there periodically. It's out in Spryfield, and there had been a forest fire a number of years back, and it burnt this huge tract of land, and so all that's left are these stumps. It looks like you're in a, a ghost, see sort of land. It's really strange. But, uh, but we like it out here. There we go. And it's very, very high elevation. So we're looking out here and in the distance, that is St. Mary's Loyola High Rise. And so that's uh, quite a long distance away. But we can see across from the container pier all the way across to the one that's in Bedford Basin. Uh, it's a huge panoramic view. And it's there's very little soil here. It's almost all granite. Like here's some of the trail, and it's just along, just on rock. It's it's granite all the way out. It's really neat. Anyway, so um, I'm presuming you're watching this on Wednesday, tomorrow. The uh, what would that be? The 15th of February, and you've got a discussion due on the fifth. Uh, the challenge of proving cause and effect with observational data. That and here we're looking at the question about nutrition, why my favorite foods are always bad for me. Um, you've got your assignment too. Due is due on Friday. I just posted the tutorial. And on uh, Saturday, you've got quiz six. Well, actually, normally it would be due Saturday. I have put it off a week later uh, to the end of the break. But you should best do it now, because I'll bet you will forget if you don't that you'll enjoy your break and try not to think about this course. Get it out of the way and enjoy your break, okay? A few things, if you're watching this uh, today or tomorrow, that um, or before Wednesday the 15th, the faculty union is putting on a town hall, a Zoom town hall, to explain issues to do with the strike. I understand there's a final meeting of the university and the union with conciliator happens this Friday. They're not very far apart, so hopefully they can find a solution and we'll get an agreement. On Saturday is International Night, and um, that you don't have to be an international student to go, but it celebrates the diversity of the international students. And uh, historically, it's been a really, really good uh, series of performances. What is February the 15th? the day after Valentine's Day, but it's World Hippo Day. All right, that sounds like a good thing. All right, uh, the quiz that didn't go as well as many of you uh, would have liked. Uh, you may have been overly optimistic because test number one, as I say quiz two update is test two update, that um, uh, uh, test number one was a very easy test. It was to warm you up. Uh, future tests, they're more challenging. But I like the average to be 65, 70%, something like that. And this one was a bit too low. And so we boosted you all up 0.5. Doesn't sound like much out of eight, but it's enough that it moves uh, the average up uh, by five or six percentage points. Uh, to, so you're now, the uh, average is around 70. But there were some questions, there were many that were very easy, almost everybody got them right. But then there's a bunch that a lot of people got incorrect. And I'm just gonna zip through a couple of them. I'd like to be able to pose them to you. I'm just gonna show you pictures with the results from one of the classes. So in order to create a pivot table in Excel, uh, which of these are correct? All columns must have different unique labels. There can be no missing values in the data set. Uh, all of the data values must be numbers. 
or all of the above are true. Come on, we know that we've been playing with a data set that's got a whole bunch of missing values and with some of the values being words. So B and C are wrong. A is the only one that's right. But people jump for the, all of the above are true. Hmm, okay. Uh, here's another one that the, so we've got a table of showing the different groups of students, the different survey years, four different years, where the students are from. And we're interested in looking at uh, how that pattern has changed over the four years. So are we more larger proportion from Nova Scotia or a smaller proportion from China? What's happened here? So that do we flip rows and columns? That's not gonna change things. Do we want percentage of the column total, percentage of row total, percentage of grand total? It's rare in this course, at least that we'll look at percentage of grand total. It's not used an awful lot. We're comparing groups. What are the groups we're comparing? We're comparing the four different years and then where are they from? So our groups are in rows. So we want percentage of row total. Percentage of column total would be comparing of all the Nova Scotia students that uh, how many of them came in 2020 versus 2021, 22, 23. No, that's not what I want. So percentage of row total. I know lots of people got it right. But lots of people picked other answers. So here's another one that's again, we need to figure out. This is on average, um, how many hours of work of a week do you work? And I'm comparing Canadian students to international students and looking at those four different years. And that you will see that, hmm, there might be some differences between Canadian and international. There might not be. There's a lot of noise here. That So how do I clean this up? What do I want within this? Um, that, uh, that um, do I want to change things to percentage of row total or percentage of column total? These are averages, they aren't frequencies. Should I drag hours work to the filter box, get rid of the blanks, the zeros, and the extreme outliers? Yeah, why? I'm looking at how many hours a week do you work? So why should there be zeros? I, I don't want them in my average. I'm looking at those that are working. So yeah, I'd like to get rid of those ones and obvious ones that are crazy numbers. Do nothing, the table's complete. Not quite. It was almost, but. I, I should clear, clean up messy data. Okay, here's another thing for you. That I wanna make a histogram about um, number of hours per week that you're, you're working, like you do in your assignment. So should I that drag hours work to the rows? Do I put ID in the values box and summarize with count? Do I drag hours work to columns? Uh, should I select a row label and then select group and adjust the starting values, ending values, and that sort of thing is appropriate? Okay, do I need to group the rows together? We need to do four of those, uh, three of those things. The one we don't do is put drag work hours to columns. I'm not quite sure if people got thrown off by what steps should we not do? And we should not do C. The, all the other ones are ones we should do. And I think it may be not threw you off. So um, I've looked at categories of student employment and I'm looking at the last four years and what's happening here um, that I'd like to create a pivot chart. What sort of chart am I gonna get? Is it gonna be a column chart with, um, on the horizontal axis, I'll have the different work groups, excess time, full-time, half-time, part-time, not working. 
uh, is it going to be a clustered column chart with year on the horizontal axis and then the others in labels? Or would work group be the categories on the horizontal axis? Or what was the last thing? Nobody picked it in this class. A stack column chart. Okay, nope. Excel takes whatever you put in rows and makes it the horizontal axis. So I've got years being the row labels. That's going to be on my horizontal axis. So B is the right one. And I think that's it. So today, anyway, we're getting into simple linear regression and we're going to do models in Excel. And so I'm going to look at how do I create the model in Excel? How do I fit it? And then the output I'm going to get, how do I interpret it? I'm going to interpret the coefficients of the model, what the formula is. I'm going to look at the accuracy of those estimates, and I'm going to look at the accuracy of the model as a whole. Okay. So remember, we're building a function that is going to predict credit card balance, that we're going to use a very simple model. The simplest one we can use is a straight line, and to use just one variable to predict that credit card balance. We're going to pick the, our, that's our target variable is what we're trying to predict. We're going to use rating to make that prediction because rating has the strongest correlation balance. It has the strongest linear correlation and we're looking at a linear model. Straight line means linear. So what we're going to do, there's a shortcut you can do it in uh, doing it with a scatter chart and I'm going to skip over that. I'm not interested in that. What I want to do is do a proper build a model. So I am going in uh, to go to the data analysis and the regression function to be able to do that. And I'm going to show you how to find the regression function. It's going to ask for a number of different things. It wants to know where do they got to find the y variable, the one on the vertical axis. Where are they going to find the x variable, or actually we're going to later, after the break, look at x variables. We'll have multiple ones. So what are the predictor variables? And that um, do we have labels on the columns? And we're going to use labels. I recommend that you do that. Um, and uh, generally, I suggest you have your output put into a new sheet so you don't get too much clutter. Okay? So, and we're gonna get an output that looks like this. And I'll just tell you that with the output, it's got three tables in the output. The first one is the performance of the model as a whole. Let's talk about that. Second one is something you'd use in the statistics course we're not gonna look at. And the third one is information about the coefficients that are in the model. Okay, so what's the formula for my model? Okay, and we're gonna look at those different pieces, piece by piece. Give, oh, oh, oh. Me, I don't want to have that. Um, okay, let's get out of, out of this here. Here we go. And let me go over to Excel. Okay, let me get my controls out of the way. So here's my data file um, that you can copy what you want into a separate sheet if you want. It's not a bad idea. Like I could take rating and balance and I'll copy them and I'll put them in a new sheet. Okay. That, as a rule, I like doing that. I like if every time I build a model, I create a new sheet for the model. Okay. Oh, get it away. Now I'm going to want to build the model. And so I'm going to go up to data, data, where are we? Data analysis. I'm going to go down here to regression. See it there? OK. So where is the y variable? I'm predicting balance. That's in column B. So I could click on the elements in that column. Um, it says just B. I don't like doing it that way. So I think it'll work. I'm going to do B. It starts in row one. 
and it goes to B401. There's 400 data values plus the label, so 401. The X variable is in column A, where the rating is, A1 to A401. I often get them backwards because it asks for Y first, and X second. And usually Y is on the far right of my um, table here. I've got labels for my variables. I got names to them, okay? And I said, I'm gonna put it in a new worksheet. Okay, I'll do that anyway, okay? I'm gonna put it to a new worksheet and I'm gonna click okay. The other things here, we'll do them in a future class. And it gives me a big table. Get this out of my way, make my table bigger. So I was telling you that it's got two pieces. One of them, it's summary information. You may want to make the columns wider so you can read the names that are here. And the only important ones are generally the first three columns, at least for this course. So this tells me about performance, and I'll explain that shortly. The second one, you can ignore altogether in this course. And the third one, we're going to look at right now. It tells me about the formula itself. So let's go back to our slides. Uh, where are we? Here we go. So what's this portion telling me? It says the intercept is minus 390 and the rating is 2.566. This is my formula. My formula is going to have the target variable is equal to an intercept plus slope times a variable. So the intercept is minus 390.85 plus 2 point, I rounded it off to 2.57 times the rating. So this gives me the coefficients for this formula. This is the equation of the line that goes through that scatter. Okay? And I like to remind myself that it's only an estimate. It's only based upon these 400 observations. If I looked at 400 other customers, I should get similar results, but a little bit different, different estimates, okay? And it only tells me the line. The line tells me on average what happens with a customer with a certain rating. So let's look at that. So that's the intercept is minus 390. It doesn't make an awful lot of sense. But, and the slope is 2.57. So the um, intercept is the value of your target balance when your x variable, your predictor variable, is zero. So if the person had a credit rating of zero, their credit card balance would be almost minus $400. Does a negative balance on your credit card mean? It means the bank owes you money. <laughs> that sounds like a good news story. Um, seems strange though. Why is that happening? We'll see in a minute. The slope is if I change X a little bit, how much does Y change? So if the credit rating increases by one unit, one point, how much will the balance change? It will go up by $2.57 on average. Not for every customer that some it'll be more, some it'll be less, but on average, it'll be 2.57. It's an average rate of increase. Okay. So if I draw a picture of what I just told you, here is my line going through my scatter of points. And as I get down here, it eventually, the balance should drop down to zero. And it does with a credit rating around 150. But for lower credit ratings, well, it should just stay at zero, but I've got a straight line. So my straight lines just can keep going downhill. I shouldn't use this formula when I've got credit ratings that are extremely low and I don't have any that are down at zero uh, because the model really doesn't work. I'm using a straight line as an approximation to maybe what the correct model should be. And that for where I'll typically use it out here in the middle, I'm fine, uh, but down at the extremes, extremely low, the model really doesn't work and I shouldn't use it down there. So 
intercepts very frequently end up giving you silly values, negative values when your variable can't be negative. Uh, but it's just, you need it to be able to get the other portion of your line. So I shouldn't use this if I have credit scores down below 150, because the model just won't work right. So um, remind you though, that those points, look at them, they're scattered all over the place. On average, that's where the orange line is. So if you had a credit score of 500, the model says on average, the average customer borrows about $900. Some will borrow more, some will borrow less, but on average, about $900. Well, does that make sense? Well, I went and looked at that. I looked not at customers that borrowed or had a rating of 500, but I looked at those between 480 and 520. And there were 21 customers in there. And guess what? The average of them was $893. That was almost exactly what my model said. Um, so it is good at estimating the average. But if I looked at individual customers, I got awful predictions because I've got customers with balances anywhere from $250 to $1,411. So the model might be good for the average, but it may not be good for individuals. And that is very common with regression models. Now, remember though, it's just an estimate that that was my estimate of the average for customers with a credit rating of 500. And that estimate was based upon two estimates an estimate of the intercept and an estimate of the slope. So if I had a different set of data, I'm gonna get slightly different estimates. How big would the difference be? That's where standard error comes in. Standard error generally, and if you call with averages, we had standard error that we didn't pay too much attention to it. That this means that the estimate of the intercept could be off by $29 maybe even twice that by $58, but probably not by more than twice the standard error. And the estimate of the slope, that 2.57, could be off by 0 0.075, maybe even twice that amount. So it could be off by 0.15 either way. That, so remind yourself, you've always got just estimates here. They're not perfect. What does it mean? Well, if if I wiggle my intercept by two standard errors up and down, then my line moves up and down by two standard errors. So the orange one is what I estimated, but maybe the correct line is the top blue one or the bottom blue one or something in between. Probably not more than that. And what about, whoops, the slope? Here we are. Um, sorry, there's the slope. What about the slope? Well, it could be off by a little bit as well. So it could be a steeper line, it could be a flatter line. Maybe the slope is 2.42 or 2.72. And so if I take that into account, I get a line that wiggles up and down. Okay, that, um, Oops, yeah, see, so yeah, I jumped over a bunch of slides. So my slope could be off, my intercept could be off. And if I combine both those two things, then my line can wiggle, twist, and slide up and down at the same time. It goes all over the place. So um, generally our estimates are quite good in the middle, but you can see because of the twisting, they probably are not very good at the ends that, um, but again, they only estimate the average, not individuals. So how would I describe the quality of my model? Well, quality depends upon what you're trying to achieve. That, is it accurate? Well, it's probably quite accurate in measuring the average. We've just seen that, but it doesn't look very good for predicting individual customers. So if I'm looking at individual customers, how do I ev evaluate how good my predictions are? That um, depends upon what you want. 
So if you were off by a hundred dollars, is that good? 200, 300? When does it get bad? That if you predicted their balance would be $900 and the correct value was a thousand, it's close. What if the correct value was 1,200? Well, it's not as good, but it's still in the right neighborhood. Suppose the correct balance is $2,000. That sounds pretty awful. Well, we've got a variety of different ways of measuring the quality of the model. And one of them is the standard error of the model. We just did standard error. We did standard error of coefficients, but we also have standard error of predictions. Okay? And that came in that first table at the top. And the standard error here is 232. What does that mean? It means don't be surprised if your prediction is off by $232. And it could be off by as much as double that, 464. So it might, it's not often that it, my prediction is off by more than that sometimes, but not very often. So this amounts to be quite a bit because most of these balances are between zero and $1,500. And here I'm making predictions that could be off by about $500. That doesn't sound very good. Okay. Well, look at your data. See that scatter above and below. My prediction had been 893. So if I look at 464 above and below, it takes me down to around 424 and up to 1,357. So 95% of my customers, I would expect to be in that range. 5% the extreme people, they're gonna be off that. I'm not worrying generally about the extreme 5%. Show me the usual 95%. That's within two standard errors. That's still an awfully big range. This really doesn't sound like a very good model. Are there other ways? Can I give it a grade? Like, if you look at this model, what grade would you give it? A D? A C? Can you give it a B? Maybe, nah. Maybe a C or a D. Well, there is a method of giving it a grade. It's called R square. Uh, that's what most people use to call it. Its official name is the coefficient of determination, whatever that word means. That suppose you want to know a customer's credit rating, but you didn't know anything about your customers other than we've got 400 customers, okay, that on average they borrow about $500 and some of them don't borrow anything and some of them borrow almost $2,000. So I've got a customer coming in. What's your best guess of that customer's balance if I had to give it one number? Just one. I don't know. Maybe guess what the average is? If you don't know anything else and I've got to give you one number, just one prediction, just like my model was giving one prediction before of say 900, um, my best guess would be the average of all customers. So. That's $520. That's like saying the black line there. Have a model that is the black line. That if you have got a credit rating of zero, if you've got a credit rating of 1,000, I'm still going to predict 520 because I'm going to predict your average because I don't know your credit rating. So is the black line all that bad? It looks OK in the middle, but it, it's pretty awful at the ends. The orange line looks better at the ends. How much better is the orange line compared to the black line? Okay. Well, I'm worried about making mistakes, errors. How far is my prediction away? And look out at the end here. See, I've got these blue dots. They're pretty close to the orange line. They're pretty far away from the black line. Down here in the middle, the orange and the black line are maybe just as good. Down here at the very beginning, the orange line is much better than the black line. The gaps are smaller for the orange line than they are for the black line. So, and we're interested in squaring the errors. 
So let's look at the total of the squared errors. If I use the model, total of the squared errors. If I don't use the model, and so I'm looking at, relatively speaking, how much smaller are the errors? Or if I subtract it from one, how much of the error of the noise have I been able to eliminate, get rid of? That, so I'm subtracting it from one, which sometimes confuses people. But what people say is, uh, with this model, it's 0.75. So I've eliminated 75% of the error, or some people will say that the model explains 75% of the variation in card balances. Does it? Sounds really good. 75 is a solid B. Would you have given that model a B? I don't know. Depends upon the person. Um, but that's what R squared measures. And ideally, we'd like to have a model that has a very high R squared. It explains 99% of the variation. Ideally, 100% of the variations. R squared can get up to 100%. So, what? How high can I push R squared? Well, how would I make it better? That we'll look at that after the break. How do you make that model better? So we've used the regression function to find an equation of a line. We found the coefficients that um, they're only estimates. So you have to worry about the accuracy of that line. The line though only measures the average value. And it's possible my model is very good at estimating the average, what happens on average, but it may not be very good for individuals. If I'm looking at individuals, then I need a different measure for it. This is a value estimation application I've done. If you really wanted to look at the influence of credit ratings on borrowing, then that would be getting into a causal analysis. So if I could find a way of improving someone's credit rating, maybe that would get them to borrow more. Okay. How do I change their credit rate? If I was interested in those people that just uh, had a balance of zero, and seeing what's wrong with them, why don't they use their credit card? That's a classification problem. But regression might help me get insight into what those are. Okay, so we have different types of things. Value the regression is quite good for value estimation. It's not very good for classification, but we'll see that later on. Watch out. Estimates are just that, estimates. They're not perfect. They have errors to them. And our predictions are not perfect. That standard error is going to be the best way for us to measure accuracy of estimates and accuracy of predictions. A lot of people like R square. We will be looking at it. Next class, after the break, we're going to look at how to improve the model. Um, and we're going to try improving it by like adding variables. We can run into trouble with that. Maybe we've got a curve and we've used a straight line. So how do I calculate the equation for a curve? And could I include categorical variables? Like we know about their gender, marital status, student status, ethnicity. How do I add that to a model? We're going to look at all these different types of ways of improving a model. And that is going to be the end of our story for today.